Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. All right, so uh, welcome back to the lecture nine. Today we are going to sort of cover uh, this lecture in the third part where I'm going to talk about uh, what are called as Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, Monte Carlo simulations are a popular tool um, uh, for attaining numerical solutions uh, for problems that might otherwise have analytical solutions. Um, and we, were, we are going to cover this topic on Monte Carlo simulations for specifically assessing uh, statistical inference under spatial dependence. So uh, that would mean that I'm going to sort of specify or talk about a computational algorithm um, or an experiment design that can be implemented on a, on a personal computer, which can provide us, you know, the results that we have derived in the previous lecture for statistical inference uh, under spatial autocorrelation or a given spatial dependent structure. All right, so uh, a little bit introduction on uh, Monte Carlo simulations. So uh, Monte Carlo algorithms or Monte Carlo experiments are computational algorithms that employ randomness and repeated sampling to arrive at numerical solutions. So uh, critically, I am pointing out that uh, Monte Carlo simulations will exploit stochasticity, right? So they will exploit uh, uh, randomness in, uh, 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 in terms of designing an experiment, and they will then also rely on repeated sampling, right? So you are going to be somehow sampling again and again from a, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, from a parent uh, uh, distribution, okay? And the example that we covered in the last, uh, you know, uh, 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 lecture, uh, that is of a circular city, we can establish whether or not uh, the mean estimator and the confidence bounds, uh, the 95% confidence bound are indeed uh, consistent estimators uh, 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 in the presence of spatial dependence using simulations, right? So that's the sort of uh, power here. And these methods provide an alternative for the analytical framework that yields a deterministic solution, right? So there, you know, we had a, uh, a uh, when we said that, you know, the mean of prices on a circular city are n plus one over two, we did not say that, that they could be n plus one over two plus minus something, right? So then we kind of had a analytical solution that the mean of prices for the circular city is n plus one over two, where n is simply the number of homes uh, in this city, right? So, uh, so we, let's begin looking at the steps in Monte Carlo simulations. Before we do that, you know, I just want to sort of give you a very quick recap of this practice problem that we have worked with, where we introduced the uh, circular city and we solved for the mean estimator, the variance estimator, the standard deviation estimator, and the 95% uh, confidence bounds uh, for uh, home prices, uh, you know, uh, spatially distributed on a uh, circle with a uh, 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 circumference of k units, okay? So here, you know, if you, uh, just a quick reminder, you know, we are basically worked, we were basically working with first order neighbors on a circle. So we had, you know, entities uh, P1, P2, P3, P4, which are, uh, you know, denoting both prices as well as location. So the index on the price P is the location. So location one, location two, location three, and corresponding price P1, corresponding price P2, P3 respectively on these locations all the way till location n, all right? And we are given a specific spatial dependence structure. We talked about this in detail. You can refer to the previous lecture uh, on, on details of what this means. And for this particular scenario, we estimated, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, population mean, what would be the best guess of population mean? We said it will be P bar. We came up with a, 
uh, a, a analytical solution of p bar that is n plus 1 over 2. We came up with analytical solution of variance of p bar, p bar which was sigma squared over n times 1 plus 2 lambda. Uh, again, all of this was done step by step in detail in the previous lecture. And then we had the, you know, uh, 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 the estimator for standard deviation of p bar and then we had the confidence bounds, right? So now, today's lecture, in this lecture, we are going to try and, you know, arrive at these estimators using simulations rather than mathematical derivation or, anal or analytical derivation. So we are going to arrive at them numerically is what uh, the agenda of this lecture is, okay? So let's go over uh, the steps in Monte Carlo simulations and, and, and through this also learn what are Monte Carlo uh, simulations. So step one, uh, it says start with a true model that employs a stochastic component to specify the given spatial dependence structure. So first of all, we say start with a true model. True model of what? Of the price process on this circular city, right? So true model for PIs, right? For each PI, we need a model that helps me arrive at this value of PI. This model should employ a stochastic component, right? So there will be some kind of a random number uh, which will be uh, uh, used or random variable that will be used to specify uh, PI. So we can sort of, you know, uh, say that, let's say it is ui with you know pdf f of u right so when we say stochastic component basically means a random variable right and i am just uh, you know uh, specifying it to be ui uh, and then it is supposed to be able to explain or encapsulate the given spatial dependence structure so when i say the given spatial dependence structure what i am talking about is that prices for first order neighbors are correlated, okay? And the degree of correlation was specified with this parameter lambda, right? So we need to parameter lambda, right? So this is the variance covariance matrix or the correlation PI PJ structure that was specified in the practice problem earlier. Okay, so let's try to do that. Um, okay, so we are going to say, I mean, let PI equals I plus UI. Now I is simply the index, which is specifying the location as well as giving it a deterministic value. So I by itself is the systemic systemic or deterministic component of price. What, deter what, what do we mean by deterministic component? What it really means is that if I'm standing at location one, I know that level of price that I'm looking at will be closer to one plus a random variable, right? And, um, uh, you know, if I'm standing at location 10, then I have an index of what level of price I'm looking at. If I'm standing at location 100, a location 1000, I am giving a deterministic level to prices through this systemic component I. And then to this systemic component, I'm then adding this random component, random or stochastic component. of price, right? And now the next, the, the final condition for this, uh, you know, stochastic comp component that is that it should specify a given uh, spatial dependence structure, right? So we are going to write, da write UI as uh, lambda over two, epsilon I minus one, plus lambda over two, epsilon I plus one plus epsilon i such that epsilon i's are 
i i d so independently and identically distributed with uh, you know according to a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance 1 so epsilon i is are basically you know uh, uh, i i d random variables which are uh, which behave according to a standard normal uh, distribution okay and now we have to check you know we should validate or check that this indeed you know uh, 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 specifies a uh, the given spatial dependence structure right so our model our true model is all these equations combined right so we have pi equals uh, i plus ui where ui where ui equals lambda over 2 times epsilon i minus 1 plus lambda over 2 epsilon i plus 1 plus epsilon i right so intuitively you can see that i'm using these epsilon i's to sort of uh, specify spatial dependence so the error component or the stochastic component at location i depends on the error component at location i minus 1 and on the you know uh, uh, error component at location i plus 1 right so i'm bringing in the spatial dependence through the stochastic term but i need to now make sure or validate that uh, this given structure is indeed enough or sufficient for me to ensure that it follows first order correlation with the degree of correlation being uh, given by parameter lambda to do that i'm going to sort of say uh, check check that covariance of pi and pi plus 1 should equal lambda and covariance of pi and pi minus 1 should also equal lambda right so let's do that okay so covariance of pi and pi plus 1 I'm going to expand this. I'm going to say covariance. So pi equals i plus lambda by 2 epsilon i minus 1 plus lambda over 2 epsilon i plus 1 uh, plus epsilon i comma um, and then pi plus 1 is i plus 1 plus lambda over 2 epsilon i plus lambda over 2 epsilon i uh, uh, plus 2 plus epsilon i plus 1 okay now i and i plus 1 are deterministic are deterministic uh, you know components so if i look at a deterministic component and, and and think about the covariance of this deterministic component with all the other you know deterministic and random components they are going to be zero right the covariance of epsilon i minus 1 with i plus 1 is zero epsilon i it's going to be zero because remember epsilon i's are iid right so they are independently i minus ones are independently distributed of i's right epsilon i's right so this covariance is going to be zero with epsilon i plus 2 will again go, is going to be 0 and then epsilon i plus 1 this is again going to be 0 right for so there is no contribution of to the covariance of p and pi and pi plus 1 from either the deterministic term i or this lagged spatially lagged uh, you know epsilon i minus 1 term now let's come to the epsilon i plus 1 term so i'm going to look at epsilon i plus 1 it's going to have no correlation or no covariance with the term because it's deterministic you know they can't covary co -vary because the deterministic component does not vary at all right um, and then i plus 1 with epsilon i the covariance will be 0 again because i plus 1 is independent of epsilon i second i plus 1 with i plus 2 is again going to be 0 because they are iid finally you have i plus 1 and i plus 1 so i found my first you know a uh, 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 component of covariance that will indeed 
going to sort of contribute to the covariance of pi and pi plus 1. So that is covariance of lambda epsilon i lambda over 2 i plus 1 i plus 1. Now I'm going to come to the last term which is uh, epsilon i. So epsilon i with the deterministic component has zero contribution to the covariance. Epsilon i and epsilon i, yes, we have, we will have a co, you know, a covariance uh, a contribution, right? So we can write covariance uh, lambda over 2 epsilon i comma epsilon i. And then with epsilon i plus 2, I have zero contribution because they are iid and with epsilon i plus 1, again, zero contribution because they are iid. Now, if we come back to this right hand side, we have covariance of lambda over 2 with epsilon i plus 1 and epsilon i plus 1. So this here, I can bring out this, uh, you know, uh, uh, lambda over 2, which is a constant, it will just come out. And I will have covariance epsilon i plus 1, comma epsilon i plus 1, which is nothing but variance epsilon i plus 1. And similarly, you will have lambda over 2 variance epsilon i. Now looking at uh, you know, uh, the fact that the variance of epsilon i is, is simply, uh, uh, you know, uh, 1 for all i. So we have the covariance between p i and p i plus 1 will simply sum to lambda. Similarly, you can show, similarly, you can show and you should at your time show that covariance of pi comma pi minus 1 will also be equal to lambda. So indeed what's going on now, what's happening now is that we have a true model, we have a true model, a true model of, we have a true model, true model of home prices that exhibit the spatial dependence structure on a circular city, right? So this spatial dependence structure is the given spatial dependence structure right we should we should be able to sort of you know follow or specify the structure that we are working with right so we are indeed able to work with so so thumbs up to step 1 okay so let's move on to step 2 now it says draw random components of size of the size of the circular city that is n okay so for example for this example i'm simply going to say n equals 100. So what I'm saying is that there are 100 homes located on this circular city, right? For the, for the purpose of understanding, there are 100 homes, you know, uh, located on the city. So this is P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6, P7, P8, keep going till P100. And just before P100, we'll have P99. Okay, it says draw the random components of the size of the, uh, the circular city. That means I have to go back to my model that I have specified earlier. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to write down the model at the top of the, at the top of your slide here. So I have PI equals I plus UI where UI equals epsilon I plus lambda over 2 epsilon I minus 1 lambda over 2 epsilon i plus 1 such that epsilon i's are simply i i d normal 0 comma 1 for every i okay so what am i doing now okay so now what i'm what i'm doing is i am generating or constructing my own data i'm simulating a data set of prices of these 100 ohms homes located on the given circular city what that would mean is that I can just go to an Excel sheet, right, and, 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 and start populating it as follows. So I have my rows, okay, 
I have my rows. The first row is I, that is the ID, the home ID. I have first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, keep going, 99, 100. Okay, then I have, uh, you know, uh, uh, psilon I minus one, psilon I, and psilon I plus one. Each of epsilon i's, that is epsilon i minus one, epsilon i and epsilon i plus one, they are simply normally distributed with zero mean and uh, variance one. So I can simply apply a, uh, you know, a, 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 a random draw from a standard normal distribution in an Excel sheet, which is a, which is a coded fin uh, exercise, right? It's already canned in the Excel sheet. So you can go ahead and do that. But you will, what you're, what you're going to expect is, you're going to have these, uh, you know, uh, uh, 0 0.01, 0 0.03, minus 0 0.9, you know, uh, 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 and so on and so forth. So you're going to have these random entities generated individually one by one so that there is no relationship between epsilon i minus one, epsilon i and epsilon i plus one. You are simply drawing from a uh, standard normal distribution three times, right? The first time is, uh, you know, you are doing it for epsilon i minus one. The second time you're doing it for epsilon i and third time you're going to do it for epsilon, uh, you know, uh, 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 i plus one, right? So let's say I get a minus uh, 0 0.23 here as the first row, then I have 0 0.56 and I have uh, 0 0.8 and so on and so forth till 100 values. Uh, let's say here I have 0 0.9, um, 0 0.8, 0 0.7 and so on and so forth, right? So there are random entities being generated. Of course, when you will take mean of any of these random entities, they will turn out to be zero because you're drawing from that distribution, right? Or very, very close to zero. Right, that's what we should expect. Finally, once you have done that, you have created data, uh, which, uh, so basically you have uh, uh, four columns that you have generated. One, the so first one is a deterministic column. It is simply, uh, you know, the value of the ID itself, right? So it's just a deterministic, you know, when I say I equals one, I don't mean I is one and plus minus something. I mean, I equals one, it's deterministic. Right, and then I have three different normally distributed independent random variables being drawn, which I denote to be epsilon i minus one, epsilon i, and epsilon i plus one. Okay, uh, of course, when um, when you know when I'm, when i is one, epsilon i minus one means hundred. Yeah, I'm looking at the hundredth home, and epsilon i plus one means that I'm looking at the second home. You know, assuming I'm going uh, clockwise on the circle. So using these, I can then define pi as i plus lambda over two, right? So then i minus one plus lambda over two, so then i plus one plus plus epsilon i, okay? Now in order to populate pi, the column of pi, data in the column of pi, I must also specify lambda, okay? So in the true model, I'll go back to my true model and I'm going to specify, I'm going to say, let, let lambda equals 0.4 for the Monte Carlo simulations. Okay, and then once I have my, you know, uh, uh, the specification, I am basically saying lambda by two is 0.2, 0.2 and I have data on uh, these values. So pi is nothing but one minus 0.2 multiplied by minus 0 0.01 plus 0.2 multiplied by 0.9 plus minus 0.23, which will turn out to be some numerical value, right? So you have created this data set of pi's Okay, so you have created, you have simulated, these are simulated data for PIs. The beauty of these data are that they follow the exact same first order 
spatial autocorrelation structure that the practice problem provided us uh, in the previous, uh, you know, uh, uh, lecture, right? So now we have actual values to work with that behave according to the analytical problem that we were solving in the previous, uh, you know, in the previous lecture. Step three, so evaluate PIs along with mean value, its mean value, variance, standard deviation, fifth and 95th percentiles. So we have already in the, in step two, we collected this data on, on, on PIs. So now I have I, which goes from one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, all the way to 99 and 100. I will also have these values of PIs, which I have created in step two. So I've constructed data on P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6, so on and so forth till P99 and P100. Once I have these data, once I have the data, I can calculate the mean, which is simple. So I can just say P bar equals summation, I equals one to 100 PI. Remember, this P bar is a function of lambda being set as 0.4. It is also a function of N being set as 100, right? So it's, it's for 100 homes, you could be working with 1000 homes, you could set N equals 1000, it's not going to be a very difficult exercise to do that, right? You can see that, right? So what I'm saying is that my PI itself is a function of setting lambda equals 0.4, and n equals 100, and this is what it will look like. Similarly, I have, uh, sorry, it's not pi, it's p bar. Similarly, I have variance of pi, variance of, uh, you know, uh, pi or p bar, that will, uh, you know, variance of pi will be summation i equals one to n, which is 100, pi minus p bar, the whole square divided by n minus one, which is 99, right? Now this I can call as sigma hat squared p. With that we know variance of p bar will be just sigma hat squared p divided by n, that is 100, right? Standard deviation of p bar will be sigma hat squared p by 100, the square root, and the 95th confidence bound is nothing but that I order these data, order PIs in, uh, you know, uh, 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 descending, right, With, in descending values. So basically you have uh, the highest value as the first topmost value and then it just keeps going down to the minimum value. So descending, uh, um, from max of pi to min of pi. And then you pick the, from bottom you pick the fifth value, the fifth value from uh, min pi will be the 95th percentile of the prices. And the 95th value from bottom, that is the minima of PI will be denoted as, uh, uh, sorry. So, so I made a typing error here. So the top one will be P5, the fifth percentile, and this will be 95th percentile. And the confidence bound, the confidence bound for PIs will be uh, uh, P fifth to P 95th. All right, so this is a simulated mean, a simulated variance, a simulated standard deviation and a simulated bound, right? That is very, very important, okay? Uh, you could, I mean, this is for PI, if you wanted the confidence bound for P bar, I mean, you could you could sort of, you know, uh, 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 we'll see how to do that now, next. So step four is replicate steps two and three 500 times. So now we are going to replicate the simulated prices and their averages, okay? So let's see. So step two was that we first construct data on PI. Step three was we collect 
these statistics on PI. Okay. And then finally, we, we, cut, we create these replicas of PI, right? So we, we basically have, uh, you know, uh, uh, so, you know, the first time we did that, we can say that was replica one. For that replica, we got P bar M, right? We got variance of P bar M equals one, sorry. So at P bar M equals one, the standard deviation of P bar for M equals one, okay, so we got these values. Um, and then, you know, uh, 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 we, we can create the second replica. The second replica will be, we start the process all over again. We have our eyes, we draw, you know, we, we, we create these random draws for epsilon i minus one, for epsilon i, epsilon i plus one, again construct data on pi's and then get our p bar. Right, so I'm gonna get P bar for the second replica, for the third replica. Remember, in each replica, N is fixed as, at constant 100 and lambda is kept at 0.4. So we don't change those parameters. All the P bars are simply because we are drawing from the, from the normal distribution with zero mean and variance one for the second time, for the third time, for the fourth time, and we keep doing it 500 times, right? So we are going to keep doing it for 500 times and we are going to collect our data, right? So we are going to store these P bars for M e for till M equals, M equals 500, sorry about that, right? So we have these replicas of P bar going from the first replication the first replica to the 500 replica, the only very, very important thing to keep in mind is that for all these replications, right, so through out all these replications, we fix n equals 100 and lambda equals 0.4. Okay, so this is step four. Let's go to step five. The step five says, contrast the numerical estimators with their analytical counterparts. So now we have, you know, the numerical estimators in the sense that if you go back, we have P bars, which we have 500 values of P bars, right? So we have an Excel column of M's, which goes from one to 500. And then we have P bars, which, you know, uh, go from, uh, which, which are different values of, of average prices through each iteration of simulated construction of mean. Once I have 500 means, I can take a meta mean or some kind of a P bar bar, which is nothing but summation M equals one to 500 P bar M over 500, right? So I can, I can get my P double bar. Similarly, I can get my variance of P bar as nothing but summation M equals one to 500 P bar minus P double bar, the whole squared divided by N minus one, which is here, which will be M minus one here, which is 500 minus one, that is 499, right? Um, standard deviation of P bar, uh, is uh, basically the square root of the variance of P bar calculated uh, just, just now. And the 95th and the fifth percentile will nothing but, I will simply take these values that I've generated from 500 replicas. I'm going to order them from the smallest value or to the largest value or the other way around, from the largest to the smallest. Let's work with from the smallest value to the largest value, right? The value that I'm looking at, which is at the 95th percentile is the 25th value starting from the smallest value all the way up to the 25th value that I find will give me P bar fifth percentile, right? And 475th value starting from the minima all the way up to the maximum 475th value in this simulation will be uh, my P bar 95th, okay? Now realize that these estimators, the P double bar, variance of P bar, standard deviation of P bar, 
and the fifth and the 95th percentiles are nothing but uh, you know uh, 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 they are really numerical solutions of uh, you know the the mean estimator for uh, you know prices that are spatially autocorrelated and all other statistics the second moment as well as the fifth percentile and the 95th percentile right so these percentiles are simulated confidence bounds for p bar right so as a next step what we are going to do is we are going to contrast them we can then contrast them with the analytical solutions that we spent a full lecture previously to arrive at right for example now i have my numerical solution I have my numerical solution where p bar, p double bar is nothing but summation m equals 1 to 500 p bar indexed with replication m divided by 500 against the analytical solution where I calculated this p bar to be n plus 1 over 2 n being 100 you know I basically have 101 over 2 so I can contrast whether or not they are close and if you conduct this exercise you will find that they are going to be indeed very very close right and which which makes sense but one thing that we have to understand is that for both these cases n is fixed at 100 and lambda at 0.4 Okay. Similarly, the variance in case of, you know, the simulated solution, variance of p bar is summation m equals 1 to 100 p bar m minus p double bar whole squared divided by 499, right. And in the, in the other case, you know, it was p bar equals sigma squared by n 1 plus 2 lambda. Remember, Sigma squared in our case has been, uh, you know, uh, 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 fixed to, uh, uh, we'll have to figure out the variance of P, which will be, uh, uh, you know, variance of PI from where PI equals I plus UI. Remember, UI is a function of three epsilon I, right, which is I plus epsilon I by, uh, you know, uh, two into lambda, i minus 1 plus epsilon i plus 1 into lambda over 2 plus epsilon i. So the variance of pi, which I'm going to just quickly calculate here, is going to be lambda squared over 4 plus lambda squared over 4 plus 1, which is nothing but 1 plus lambda squared over 2. So variance of pi is 1 plus lambda squared over 2, lambda is 0.4. Right, so lambda square is going to be 0 0.0016, right? So 1 plus 0 0.0016 divided by 2, which is nothing but 0 0.0008. So this is 1.0008, right? So I'm going to now change this to my analytical solution will be 1.0008. You guys should definitely check my calculations divided by 100. 1 plus twice of 0.4. So, so in black, we have an analytical solution. In green, we have a simulated solution, right? They should, they should be very close, right? If, if, if our simulations are correct, they're, they're going to be very, very close, right? Then, you know, I can similarly, I can sort of do the same thing for, you know, the standard deviation of p bar and the standard deviation of, you know, uh, uh, p bar, which is nothing but variance of p bar from the analytical solution. And then finally, my, my confidence bounds, my confidence bounds are uh, p fifth, p bar fifth and p bar 95th that we calculated previously, right? We calculated on the previous slide, right? And in the, in the analytical case, this was given by uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, so the confidence bounds just a second the confidence bounds were given by n plus 1 over 2 minus 1.96 into sigma over root n 1 plus 2 lambda to the square root comma n plus 1 over 2 plus 1.96 sigma over root n 1 plus 2 lambda square root right so these were my 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 confidence bounds and you know they should match the ones on the left hand side in green okay finally we can check for consistency of our estimators and what does it mean to check for consistency that would simply mean that as n approaches infinity practically it would mean as i increase the value of n the size of the circular city or the number of homes the density of the city um, what i should find is that the simulated simulated mean variance standard deviation confidence bounds should uh, you know uh, 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 should uh, become closer and closer to their analytical counterparts okay so 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 we have really gone through a full blown uh, you know a uh, a uh, 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 simulation exercise to arrive at numerical solutions for estimators of mean variance so the first moment the second moment the confidence interval this so to conduct statistical inference in case we did not want to go through all that math right so we can use computational algorithms computational simulations to get there so monte carlo simulations are very very important uh, you know they are uh, they are used widely so this is a very important topic and I, I urge you all of you to sort of go over it one more time and i hope you had fun uh, learning Monte Carlo simulations. See you next time.